Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church for our morning service in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a few announcements for today. Uh, Wilma is doing much better. She's expected to make a full recovery. Anneli also is doing better but still has some pain, so please be in prayer for them. Uh, Friday, the Gems will close their season with one uh, with a fun afternoon, so please be in prayer for them as well. Let us prepare our hearts and minds now for the worship of the living God with silent prayer. Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present among us this morning. Please turn with me to hymn number 88. Oops, sorry, that's not the right one. Number 32, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 32.
For our encouragement for Christian living, we come to Article 13 and 14 of the Canons of Dort, the third and fourth main points. This is found in the Psalter Hymnal on page 908. The way God works to instill faith in us is a bit mysterious to us. Now, we learn that, of course, from John 3, where the, the way of the Holy Spirit is likened to the wind. We don't know where it comes from or where it's going, but we can see its effects. But we also know that this is a resurrection of the soul. In the resurrection of the soul, we are necessarily passive in that. Faith is therefore a gift of God. He instills it in us. He doesn't even just make it possible to believe. He actually gives us that belief so that we will believe and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason this is encouraging is because if it really were up to dead people, spiritually speaking, to make themselves alive, it would never happen. We would remain dead. But God's grace is amazing. Articles 13 and 14. In this life, believers cannot fully understand the way this work occurs. Meanwhile, they rest content with knowing and experiencing that by this grace of God, they do believe with the heart and love their Savior. In this way, therefore, faith is a gift of God, not in the sense that it is offered by God for man to choose, but that it is in actual fact bestowed on man, breathed and infused into him. Nor is it a gift in the sense that God bestows only the potential to believe, but then awaits assent, the act of believing, from man's choice. Rather, it is a gift in the sense that he who works both willing and acting, and indeed works all things in all people, produces in man both the will to believe and the belief itself. Please turn with me in the Psalter hymnal to number 7, O Lord my God, in you I refuge seek. In the Maroon Psalter hymnal number 7.
reading for the morning is 1 Chronicles chapter 10, which you can find on page 402 in the Church Bible. The title for Chronicles in the Greek translation means the things left over. You could call Chronicles the leftovers. Things that this author wants to bring out that Samuel and Kings don't bring out. Remember, Chronicles is written after the exile and is written to answer this question. Are we still the people of God? Which is why you'll find some very interesting differences between Chronicles and Samuel Kings. Chronicles does not record the adultery and murder that David perpetrates. It does not record Solomon's follies. It records, by and large, the more positive things. It does, however, treat Saul's reign in only one chapter, whereas in Samuel, of course, it takes 20 chapters to get to the end of Saul's reign. Saul's reign is a preparation for David. It's Saul diminishing and David ascending at the same time. And so this records the death of Saul, the faithfulness of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, who of course owed a great debt to Saul. He rescued them from, um, from oppression as the first act in his reign. And so here we see and the, the explanation also for why Saul's reign was ended. It was God's judgment on him for his breach of faith and consulting a medium, seeking guidance from that instead of the word of God. And therefore the kingdom was turned over to David, the son of Jesse. It's really a, a foreshadowing of the kingdom of Satan being turned over to the kingdom of our Lord, Jesus Christ. This is the word of our God, 1 Chronicles 10. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. The Philistines struck down Jonathan and Avi Nadav and Malki Shua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him. He was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised ones come and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died. Thus Saul died, he and his three sons, and all his house died together. When all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. The Philistines came and lived in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. But when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done, to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh. They buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse. Let us come before the Lord our God in prayer. O Lord God of heaven and earth, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are the triune God we worship. You are the one who is gracious and merciful, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. You are the one true God who created this world you are the God who sustains us in this world, and you have sent a Redeemer to fix what we broke in Adam and Eve. We thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, 
We thank you that he died under the curse of the law for us, taking the curse from us and bearing it on his own shoulders. We thank you, Father, for uniting us to Christ by faith that your Holy Spirit instills in us. Help us to retain a firm hold on Christ our head. We thank you that in him the whole body of believers is nourished because he is the vine and we are the branches. We ask, Father, for you to sustain us in our spiritual growth. Enable us to see our sin more clearly and hold on to the righteousness of Christ ever more tenaciously. Enable us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to hold firmly to your way in righteousness, to grow stronger by your grace. We thank you, Father, that you refresh us every day with your mercies. We thank you for the air we breathe, the food and drink that we have, the clothing we wear, the transportation you give us, the work you give us to do, the family and friends that you have put around us, but we thank you most of all for Jesus. We thank you that you are remaking us into his image and likeness. We know, Father, that we are not yet perfected, but give us strength that we may continue to run that race with endurance. That we may reach out to the things that are ahead of us, to that prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. We understand, Father, that we are born for trouble as surely as the sparks fly upwards. And we acknowledge, Father, that there are many troubles, trials, in which you place us in order to wean us from our worldliness, to teach us the depth of our own sin and how much we need Jesus. We do know, Father, that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Help us to believe that, Lord, even in the middle of that trial. When we are pressured, keep us from despair. When we are perplexed, prevent us from losing hope. If we are sorrowful, help us to find our joy once again in Christ. Forgive us for our sins as we confess them to you in thought, word, and deed, in how we have failed to love you and our neighbor as ourselves, both in what we have done and what we have left undone. Bring us back to the blood of Jesus Christ. In his cleansing stream, let us be cleansed. We pray, Father, for those with medical needs in our midst and ask for your healing hand to be upon them. We thank you for what you are doing even now. We pray, Father, for those who have spiritual and emotional needs right now that you would be there all in all and grant them your loving kindness and your presence and fill them with your spirit. We pray for the church universal especially for those branches of the church that are being persecuted, for those who are losing their lives for the sake of the testimony. We know that you remember them. You have brought them home and that they have a place at your table. We ask that you will enable the church to stand firm no matter what trials and tribulations and persecution comes our way. We pray that the message of the church will be the truth of the scriptures that reveal the living word, Jesus Christ. We pray that we might be your instruments of change here in our community, that people might see the love of Christ and 
see the forgiveness that is there in Christ. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to turn in the Psalter hymnal to number 444, Come to the Waters. This hymn is part of a collection called Hymns for a Modern Reformation. I was at 10th Presbyterian Church when these were recorded. I was in the choir that recorded them. So they have a sort of a special place in my heart. And I hope that you will grow to love these Hymns for a Modern Reformation written by James Montgomery Boyce. Please stand and sing, Come to the Waters, number 444. Exodus chapter 34, it's found on page 87 in the Church Bible, and we'll be reading the first nine verses. Exodus 34, verses 1 to 9, hear now God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, 
and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped, and he said, If I now have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. The Jewish scholar Umberto Casuto once wrote these words, The second wedding of one who remarries his divorced wife is not quite the same as the first. The breach has been healed, but it is not possible to undo the fact that at some time the breach had existed. Another scholar, Phil Riken, responded by saying, Maybe Casuto is right. However, a second wedding has a joy all its own. It shows that even a broken covenant can be renewed. And is this bittersweet but mostly sweet renewal of the covenant agreement that we're going to explore today? This renewal of the covenantal arrangement is, if you will, a second marriage ceremony after the divorce. We'll explore this renewed covenant and second marriage under three headings. The tablets of the renewed covenant, the God of the renewed covenant, and the mediator of the renewed covenant. Verses 1 to 4 tell us about the two new tablets. They were going to be just like the first tablets. The only difference between the two was that Moses was going to cut out the stone. God would still himself write the words on the tablets. But Moses was going to cut out the two tablets. Perhaps this is God's gentle reminder of the wrath that Moses had displayed. You will remember that when Moses came down the mountain after the golden calf incident had begun, he became so full of wrath that he threw down the tablets and broke them at the bottom of the mountain, symbolizing the breaking of the covenantal agreement that the people of God had with God. God is reminding Moses of that wrath, which, though mainly justified by the people's sin, did not have to result in the breaking of the tablets. God, in fact, may be gently and somewhat humorously teasing Moses about it when he says, which you broke at the end of verse 1. But there's nothing teasing or humorous about verses 2 and 3 and the instructions that God gives Moses there. Moses is to present himself at the, with the tablets at the top of the mountain. There's not to be anyone with Moses, no one on the mountain, not even a goat near the mountain. We might ask about the reason for this isolation. There seem to be two reasons for it. The first reason is that the renewal of the covenant can only take place between God and the mediator. There could be no other people present. There shouldn't even be any distractions present in the form of animals. So the people and everything connected with the people, such as the animals, had forfeited any right whatsoever to be anywhere near the mountain. They were all in need of mediation. Therefore, only Moses could ascend the mountain at that time. Well, the second reason for the isolation is that God is about to reveal himself in a very full way in verses 5 to 8. And it's very important that this new revelation about who God is 
should be very accurately recorded so that no distortion would happen. I'm sure we all remember the game of telephone. One person whispers something in another person's ear and it travels from mouth to ear all the way through the class and the person who receives it last always has a completely different message from the one that was started. There could be none of that sort of thing going on here. It had to be accurately recorded. If there's only one person who receives and transmits the message, there's likely to be far less distortion. So that brings us to our second heading, the God of the Renewed Covenant. Moses showed himself ready to receive that message in verse 4, which serves as a bridge to the second part of the passage. And in many ways, verses 5 to 8 are the theological heart of the book of Exodus. The importance of these verses can hardly be exaggerated. They are the most quoted verses in the rest of the entire Old Testament. They occur in six quotations elsewhere in the Old Testament, in the Psalms and the Prophets. This is God, the God of the Exodus, as revealed fully as Moses can handle. He is the God of the Exodus, and most importantly for the people of Israel at this point in time, he's the God of second chances. These verses give the lie, by the way, to the common misconception of the God of the Old Testament as a vindictive, hate-filled bully. The atheist Richard Dawkins perhaps encapsulates this view of God as eloquently and incorrectly as anybody ever has. This is what he says. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Contrast that with how the Lord describes himself. The Lord. The Lord. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. The judgment of God is of his justice. Quite a difference between those two descriptions of God, isn't there? seems fairly obvious that Richard Dawkins hates God, but one might ask how you could hate a God who doesn't exist. You might as well hate a unicorn. The fact is, Richard Dawkins actually knows that this God exists, and he hates that God who does, in fact, exist. Now, he accuses God of being unjust and vindictive. God describes himself as just and merciful. God describes himself in the exact opposite way to how Dawkins describes him. Now, we don't have time to unpack just how wrong Dawkins' interpretation of the Old Testament is. But I will just point out here that the Old Testament says the exact opposite of what Dawkins says on every single particular. And the reason Dawkins is so wrong is simple, because for Dawkins, man and man's reason is the measure of all things. Therefore, if there were a God, according to Dawkins, that God would have to be, behave in the way he dictates, Dawkins. But since God does in fact exist, and he is the creator God, he does not answer to men like Dawkins. God owes us nothing. We owe God everything. God does not come to the bar of human reason, especially not 
sinful, distorted human reason. Rather, we are summoned to the courtroom of God. We do not judge God. God judges us. Exodus tells us God judges us with both mercy and justice. There are no mistakes with God. Charles Spurgeon once said, the proper object of study for the Christian is the Godhead. Understanding God as far as human creatures are able, but no one can understand God perfectly and completely except God himself. What does that mean? It means understanding his characteristics. What is he like? We call this the study of the attributes of God. What is God like? Now, notice how this passage relates to the end of the last chapter. Moses had asked to see God's glory. And God had given Moses just a small glimpse, but not the front and center of that glory. Instead, God gives Moses, in answer to his query, he gives him a list of his own attributes. The message is plain. If we want to see God's glory, then we need to know what he's like. And knowing what he is like is seeing the glory of God by faith. So what is he like? Is he like what Richard Dawkins tells us that he is? A whole list of negative attributes? Or is Exodus right? And faithfully recording the word of God. This is important. If we want to know what a human being is like, we ask about that person's characteristics. We might say such and such a person is kind and thoughtful, generous and humble. Or we might say a different person is bitter and angry or legalistic or judgmental. And if we list such characteristics, we get a basic idea of what that person is like. The list of attributes then here for God has two main ideas. God is full of grace. And God is perfectly just. And those were just the characteristics of God that Israel needed to know at this point in their history. God was going to punish Israel for its sin of the golden calf, and God did just that, but God was also going to forgive them and renew the covenant and continue to be their God, even though in the golden calf they had rejected God. Moses' response to this revelation is really the only appropriate one, isn't it? He bowed down and worshipped God. The text says Moses thought this was such a good idea that he did it in a hurry. He made haste to do this. Is that how we react when we hear about the characteristics of God? Isn't it more common for us to yawn and tell us the attributes of God don't really matter all that much to us? Why should I study the attributes of God? That sounds like a dry and dull academic theological exercise. Let's ask ourselves this question. Where would we be if God was not gracious? And merciful. The answer is not only would we be dead, but we would be suffering an eternity of punishment in hell. The attributes of God are directly related to how he treats sinful human beings. They are incredibly relevant for anyone claiming to be in a relationship to God. We might add on to this. Lots of people out there think, I don't really need to study God, theology, and all that. I just want to have a relationship with Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Oh, well, he's God a man, and you know, he came to die. Don't look now, but you just did theology. 
soon as you start describing Jesus, you're doing theology. We're all theologians. The question is not whether we're going to be a theologian, as Sproul would say, but whether we're going to be a good one or a bad one. The knowledge of who this God is, that he is a gracious and merciful God, that's vital to us. But there's a danger in studying the attributes of God. And that is to pit one attribute of God over against another. Every heretic does this. In fact, heresy can be defined as emphasizing one part of the truth about God at the expense of another. One of the most common heresies is the one that claims that since God is love, that he doesn't really care about sin and evil. That he forgives sin, that's his job. There's a reason why the revelation of God's mercy in Exodus 34 is accompanied by a revelation of God's justice. It's so that we are not tempted to forget about the final day of judgment, even while we rejoice in the mercy of God as we should. Why should we worship God? Because when God says he punishes sin and yet forgives us, that implies that the wisdom of the Lord God is manifested in its most complete form in the cross of Jesus Christ, where the mercy of God and the justice of God meet each other, the laws, perfect requirements, fully met, and we get grace. Is there any human wisdom that could have cooked up a scheme like that? That's why we bow and worship like Moses did. That's why the attributes of God are so important to the Christian life. The final section of our passage shows Moses as the true mediator of the covenant. Phil Riken says Moses is quickly turning into a defense attorney for the people of Israel. Moses uses the personal capital he has with God in order to request God's presence with his people. Remember, that was an issue in 32 and 33. God said, I'm going to go up with, you, you can go up, Moses, but I'm not going to go up with the people lest I kill them on the way. Was God lying? Of course not. He was testing the mediator. Will Moses intercede for the people, or will he just say, yeah, it's all about me. You and me together, God, that's all we need. We'll go together and you make a new people out of me. Moses passes the mediator test with flying colors. He identifies himself with the people. Now, that's not an easy thing for him to do. He calls the people stiff-necked. But if he's identifying himself with the people, he's calling himself stiff-necked as well, isn't he? And he asks God to pardon our sin. Isn't that fascinating? Moses had nothing to do with the golden calf. He was on the mountain when it was happening. He says, pardon our sin. He identifies himself with the people, even with the sin they committed that the mediator did not commit. And that's exactly what Jesus does too, isn't it? The law written on the tablets was written on the heart of Jesus in an unbreakable way. The attributes of God revealed in the middle section of the passage are a revelation of what Jesus Christ is like. We wonder how... God can be merciful and just at the same time. We, we mentioned how that could be. The answer is the cross. And of course, Jesus is the perfect mediator and identifying himself with us in our sin, though he himself never sinned. Jesus is the ultimate renewer of the covenant. When it comes to applying this passage to our lives, I would hope we've already found plenty of applicatory things, but we can look at four specific things. Recognize our all-consuming need for a mediator. 
God would meet with no one else. We cannot meet with God and live without the mediator. We can't worship God in this building without a mediator. We need forgiveness that only happens with a mediator. We need someone to take our guilt away. That means a mediator. Lots of people think they don't need one. I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. That's usually the next sentence that follows, right? Their understanding of the law is very limited, very blinkered. As we looked at in our exposition of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments apply to all of life. We are always breaking the law. Jesus said to us, if you love me, keep my commandments. The law then is written on human hearts, and it is engraved on the Christian's heart with something more permanent when we become Christians. The law is no longer our accuser. Our relationship to the law changes, you see, when we become a Christian. It used to be our accuser. It used to be the one telling us, you don't measure up, you failed. Now the law doesn't do that anymore. The requirements of the law have been fully met in Jesus. The punishment has been met. We have no curse remaining to us from the most strict demands of the law. There is no curse remaining. Now, the law is our friend. It's our guide. It says, you want to show your gratitude to Jesus for what he's done, and this is how you show it. We need the law written on our hearts. We need to not view the law as any longer an enemy. Obeying the law as a Christian is not a form of legalism. It's gratitude. Thirdly, we must love not only God, God's person, we must also love and worship God for his attributes. We love and worship God as he is gracious, as he is merciful, as he is forgiving, and also as he is just. We moan and complain about the wrongs and the evil that is in this world. If God is not just, who's going to make that right? Who's going to right the wrong of the Holocaust? Who's going to right the wrongs of history? God is the only one who can do that. And if he isn't just, that's never going to happen. You really want to see Adolf Hitler in heaven? I don't. The justice of God is something people in the West downplay because they haven't lived through the dangers of the 20th century like many others have in the world. Some in the West have. But if we ever experience the kind of injustice, say, that the Jews experienced in World War II, we would not be complaining about the justice of God. We would be worshiping Him for it. We must also take care to worship Him for all His attributes and not to see God as more one than another of those attributes. The great Reformed theologian Francis Turretin said, the attributes of God are His essence. It's not separate from. It's not distinct from, it's not an add-on to the essence of God. It is who He is. The attributes of God are who God is. All too often we separate God's characteristics from who He is, and therefore we downplay the importance of God's attributes and fail to realize how important they are for our lives. We must love God in all His many-faceted glory. And remember, this is God's answer to us now when we ask and desire to see God's glory. 
God answered Moses' request by giving him his attributes. This is the clue that we can see God by faith through the attributes, and they are glorious. And lastly, when we hear about some aspect of who God is, we should respond with worship, the worship of the one true God. When Richard Dawkins hears about the attributes of God, he responds with worship, all right, but it's a worship of Richard Dawkins, not of God. But whenever anyone, any Christian believer, hears the attributes of God, they respond in the worship of God. The proper, correct response is to worship God himself. But sometimes we respond with the incorrect and false worship of the creature. But how else could we respond properly than with proper worship when we see our God slow to anger, abounding in love, showing to us the person of Christ, renewing our covenantal marriage to him, accepting us and changing us to be like him in his attributes. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the magnificent revelation that you have made of yourself here and that you have promised that we, when we worship you, will become more and more like you in all your glorious attributes. Make us as like you as it is possible for a creature to be. We thank you for renovating our hearts, renewing us from death to life, forgiving us in Christ, displaying your mercy and your justice at the cross. Make us truly grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me in the hymnal to number 80. Lord, with glowing heart, I praise thee. Number 80. We'll stand and sing together.
Lord our God, you who have revealed yourself as the one who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in all your glorious attributes, we praise and worship you today through what we own and who we are. May you be glorified in these tithes and offerings. May your kingdom expand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.